jails in this country, it's not just here in Cook County, but across the country. Our jails are at the intersection of racism and poverty. Again, half the population of the county is black and brown, but 86% of the people in our jail are black and brown. In our juvenile justice system, it's more than 90% of the young people in our juvenile temporary detention center are African American or Latino, and they're overwhelmingly African American. Over the last five years in this office, I've talked a lot about pretrial detention, that is, who's in our jail. And I've tried to weigh, raise awareness both internally in, within county government and when I talk to groups like this one. This has brought much needed attention to the issue of criminal justice reform. It's brought new partners to the table. And we put new initiatives in place. In particular, we went to, we went to Springfield last year and got past a law which reduced the number of young people that got sent into the adult system uh, and tried as adults. We have the first, we had the first <coughs> juvenile courts in, in the United States, in the whole United States in Cook County. The first juvenile justice system in the entire nation. Um, and that was a very progressive step because young people are not adults. They are impulsive, they don't think about the consequences of their acts, <coughs> and they should be treated differently than adults. And we recognize that and set up a juvenile justice system. And then we kept expanding the number of crimes that would send juveniles to adult court where again, they would not be treated as young people in need of rehabilitation, but, the, but adults in need of punishment. So last year we were able to pass in Springfield and get the governor to sign legislation that would reduce by 70% the number of young people who were sent to adult courts. And I think that's a real uh, accomplishment. Thank you. We, we, we intend to go to Springfield in this legislative session, although things are pretty difficult down there, to try to continue to secure criminal justice reforms. So let me talk a little bit again about our jail. Uh, our jail population hovered around 10,000 when I came into office. Today it's less than 8,000, 20% reduction. All of the criminal justice stakeholders have joined together. That is the sheriff, the public defender, the state's attorney, the clerk of the court, and the chief judge, to work on this issue. And I'm very grateful uh, for that good work. Every stakeholder has pledged that we will continue to work to reduce the jail population by another 20% over the next three years. So we're trying to get the jail population down uh, to 6,000 or less. And again, if you remember that <coughs> only 7% are serving a sentence and 70% are accused of nonviolent crimes, <coughs> we can reduce the jail population without endangering our communities. Because the people who are there, overwhelmingly, are, are not accused of violent crimes. They're not accused of rape or robbery or murder or any of the things that keep us up at night. They're accused of the kind of, kind of crimes that I just described. We know that many of the people who are going to jail or in contact with the criminal justice system would be better served through community-based solutions, including mental health services, substance abuse treatment, and job training. So on any given day, a quarter to a third of our, our jail population is people who struggle with mental illness. As we've closed state mental hospitals, as we've closed city mental health clinics, more people come into our criminal justice system, into our jails, or into our public health system, into our emergency rooms, because they don't have access to their medicine, they're acting out, uh, and they're not being treated for mental illness. So, you know, when people talk about saving money by closing mental hospitals or saving money by closing mental health clinics, you have to remember that this is not saving money, it's just cost shifting. So the state may pay less because it doesn't have mental health hospitals. The city may pay less because it doesn't have mental health clinics. But as county residents, you pay more because we have to pay more in our health care system and we have to pay more in our criminal justice system. As we tackle criminal justice reform, the expansion of Medicaid has been of great help to us. So, you know, President Obama gets beat up a lot about the Affordable Care Act, ACA. But I want you to know it's been a godsend to many people. It's got lots of moving parts, but one part of it was Medicaid expansion. So Medicaid is the federal program that provides health care for people 19 to 64. Just like Medi Medicare is the program for people 65 and older, Medicaid is for people 19 to 64.
And what the Affordable Care Act did was change the rules for Medicaid. And it said every state had different rules for who was eligible for Medicaid. In our state, it was people who had disabilities. And we also added, in the last decade or so, uh, uninsured children. That was our Medicaid population. But the Affordable Care Act said whatever your state eligibility requirements are, there's now an, an income eligibility overlay. So if you made basically minimum wage or less at your job, you were eligible for federally supported health care through the Affordable Care Act Medicaid expansion. We, we started a program called County Care, which has allowed us to provide critical health care benefits to thousands of individuals, thousands of individuals, actually about 165,000 people in Cook County are now part of our, our Medicaid expansion program called County Care, including people involved in the criminal justice system. 165,000 people who previously didn't have health care or only had it sporadically as their job provided insurance. And many jobs we know in this country don't provide health insurance. If you're in retail, if you're in the hospitality industry, if you work in a restaurant, you don't often have health care. And so the, the Affordable Care Act has provided insurance for people who were previously uninsured. And this investment is paying off for the health of our communities. We need to build on this historic opportunity given us through the Affordable Care Act. And we also need to focus on uh, the ways in which our criminal justice system and our, our health care system intersect. And I, and I talked about a couple of those. If you close mental health hospitals, if you close mental health clinics, more people are end up in criminal justice systems or uh, uh, in crisis in your emergency room. I want to talk now just for a minute about the importance of the current race for Cook County uh, State's Attorney. So why is the state's attorney so important? Everyone is aware of the victims of police shootings. You've seen the Laquan McDonald video. But there's much less awareness of how ordinary people are hurt when the state's attorney seeks unnecessary and overly harsh penalties. In our criminal justice system, the state's attorney has in incredible power and discretion. The state's attorney decides who to charge and what charges to bring against them. For example, Young people who fight on school grounds may be charged with a felony. Now, I was a teacher 35 years ago. I will tell you. I taught in public schools. I taught in parochial schools. Kids fought all the time in high school. They fought in school. They fought on the way home from school. Now, if, 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 if young people were fighting, we brought them to the principal's office. Sometimes there was an in-school suspension. Sometimes there was an out-of-school suspension. But nobody was ever charged with a crime for being a teenager and fighting, right? But we've gotten to the point in this country where we criminalize petty antisocial behavior by young people, including fighting. You know, you, you can be charged with, with battery for fighting in school, right? I mean, but this is, and we make kids, we make kids into, in, 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 into criminals for this kind of um, pretty ordinary conduct, frankly. Now, many times the schools themselves put kids in the criminal justice system for stupid stuff like fighting in school. Um, but sometimes the state's attorney pursues these charges even when the school system decides that they want to proceed with them. Now, fighting should be discouraged. I'm not defending fighting. Um, but I would suggest that fighting on school grounds or fighting to and from school is not something that could put people in the criminal justice system. Sadly, in Cook County, more people are arrested in school than on the streets. I'll say that again. More young people are arrested in school than on the streets. Now, we're fortunate to have a candidate for state's attorney who understands the responsibility of the office and wants to use the power of the office to help our young people. Kim Fox spent two years working as my chief of staff. Prior to that, however, she spent 12 years in the state's attorney's office in the juvenile justice division. Uh, five of those 12 years as a supervisor. I think we need somebody who's both more fair and equitable in this office, and this election cycle gives us an opportunity to make a change there. I used to tell my students that democracy is at the same time the best and the most fragile form of government on earth. The best and the most fragile form of government on earth because it requires an active, engaged citizenry. 
Lots of people believe that they, if they vote, they're a good citizen. And I would argue that voting is necessary but not sufficient. Good citizens have to contribute their time and their money to the candidates they believe in. I spent my life um, working in, in politics. I worked in my first campaign when I was 16 years old. How many of you worked in political campaigns? Good? Not enough. <laughs> I grew up in St. Paul, Minnesota. I worked for Katie McGuad, who was the first African-American woman to run for city council. Uh, so we put out yard signs, and we made phone calls, and we stuffed envelopes. Uh, not exactly exciting work, uh, but I loved it. Uh, unfortunately, Katie McGuat didn't win, but when I came to Chicago to come to college, I continued to work in political campaigns. I, I ran twice for alderman before I was elected on my third try, uh, by which time I was 43 years old. Uh, and I'd spent almost 30 years of my life working for other candidates before I ever was elected myself. So now I'm an elected official. Um, I have a real understanding of what it takes to, to get people elected since I spent so much of my life doing it. Um, and I think it's really important for all of you in this room to be actively engaged uh, in politics. And I hope some of you will even think about running for office. In order to make our democracy strong, as I said, it's necessary but not sufficient to vote. You have to get out and work for the people that you believe in. And hopefully, as I said, some of you will, will think about running for office yourself. It takes a lot of people to make a vision to make vision a reality. And it takes persistence, it takes determination, it, it, it takes a willingness